want people to look at things differently and through a different lens when they serve. We don't want it to just be about charity. We want it to be about justice. We don't want it to be about doing something to, we want to doing something with someone. We don't want it to feel like saviorism or missionary, which sometimes volunteerism can fall Mm -hmm. into that. We really want to talk about mutuality, right? Because if two people are together doing something, two people should get something out of that mutually. It shouldn't just be a benefit on one side or the other. So it's kind of changing some of the paradigm a little bit of how we talk about volunteerism and service. And that's been a big part of the journey of Chicago Cares and the evolution over the last 30 years. That was Janae Myers, CEO and professional do-gooder at Chicago Cares. After kickstarting her career working for the City of Chicago and Mayor Daly, it was an opportunity to work with the Mayor's wife, Maggie, that opened the doors to the heart of Chicago and a new philanthropic career in public service. In this episode of the podcast, Junaid generously shares her journey from volunteer to CEO, providing an in-depth look at Chicago Care's unique volunteering program. With a mission to connect people of difference, Junaid discusses the transformative nature of volunteering and how the act of giving back has the potential to be so much greater than just completing the task at hand. Through education and leadership, Janae discusses the need to create mutually beneficial experiences that encourage cultural humility, which ultimately creates more inclusive and understanding communities full of heart. If this is your first time checking us out, the Engage Volunteer podcast aims to highlight the ways in which organizations and individuals are engaging their communities to connect them to events and causes they're passionate about. The best way to support the Engage Volunteer podcast is to click follow wherever you listen. We also really appreciate feedback on the podcast and really love to hear your thoughts. If you'd like to share your thoughts or you have someone in mind for us to interview, please don't hesitate to get in touch via LinkedIn. We look forward to the next one. Janae Myers, CEO of Chicago Cares. It is so great to have you on the podcast. How are you? Thank you. I am doing great. Doing great. Uh, We're coming off Memorial Day and having a little bit of relaxation and appreciation of everything that's happened here in the States. And Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to summer. Yes, I see. I'm looking jealously at 21, 22 degrees in Chicago at the moment. And uh, down here in uh, Melbourne, Australia, it's starting to get a little chilly, but I don't think we can complain with your Chicago winters. No, (laughs) you can't. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it's, uh, look, Chicago Care is a very special organization. Um, I'm really interested to learn about it today and how the organization functions, some uh, history behind it, how you engage with volunteers around the city. Um, So I'm sure we'll get into it. But first of all, for you, um, I'm really keen to understand your background and, and then quickly about your role with the organization to start with. Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm actually not a Chicago native, even though I've lived here for like 22 years. Uh, Everyone thinks I am. I'm from Michigan originally. So close Midwestern state. moved here right after college and had really incredible work experiences. Um, I was able to start out working here in Chicago, working for Mayor Daly. And for those of you that know anything about uh, Chicago history, uh, the Daly's are a lauded uh, political name and family here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So working for him was pretty incredible. And um, coming from Michigan and a suburb of Michigan, I was like, mayor, mayor, whatever. My dad's like, (laughs) read up on your history books, girl. Like this is going to be a whole experience. Yeah. And my role was really like helping Mayor Daly get around the city, plan all his events, um, really help him um, with all kind of his public facing anything outside of city hall that he was doing. So learned a lot and learned the city like the back of my hand and got to meet so many really incredible people. And I think, you know, what I always say about that experience was I learned business and politics from Mayor Daly and then had the experience to go and work for his wife, Maggie, um, who was really the heart of the city for a very, very long time. And she ran um, a couple different nonprofit organizations. So I, I really got to see the heart of the city of Chicago through Maggie and philanthropy and how the nonprofit sector just incredibly steps up. I think we have such a a civic sense here in Chicago, unlike Mm -hmm. so many other cities where there's such a pride in in the city of Chicago. So had a cool opportunity to work for both Mayor Daly and his wife, Maggie, and got to learn the city in so many different ways. So I think it was a a great kind of initiation. And a, a really cool part of the story is Chicago Cares, where I'm currently CEO, right? 
it's been around for 30 years. And when I first started working in the mayor's office, we, the mayor would go to events at Chicago Cares and I would staff him. And Mm -hmm. I was looking through some journals during COVID when we were all locked up in our houses, I was going through and cleaning things. And I found a journal entry that I had written 20 plus years ago on my way home to Michigan on a train from Chicago, (laughs) like my very first year there working for the mayor. And in that, I wrote how much I was loving my job and the experiences and everything else and said, I am so lucky. I need to look into that organization, Chicago Cares, and I need to give back and volunteer. Yeah. Wow. So did you start as a volunteer then? I did a couple. I did do some volunteering with Chicago Cares, but then who would think, I don't know, however many years later, now I'm running the joint, right? Um, (laughs) So it was really like kind of this manifestation of seeing the good that Chicago Cares was doing and the good in the world and knowing that I wanted to kind of play my role in that. So government nonprofit has kind of been my shtick. It's been my, you know, I kind of say I'm a professional do-gooder has been my career Mm. and it's been incredible. The things I've seen, the experiences I've had have really shaped me into who I am, but it's always been public service, which you know, is service and Mm. services giving back. So in whether it was government or the nonprofit sector, that's been the bulk of, of my work. And it's really been, I think, so shaping of who I am and who I kind of want to continue to be, how I influence others. And it's really been an amazing experience, a good run. Yeah. And working in this space, I mean, you're a classic example of someone that's seen the benefits of those and, and currently loving the, that work that you do. But working in in this side in terms of that social space, there's also challenges with that as well. I'm sure you've you've been in the role a while and, and Chicago Cares as an organization, you know, I see it's 30 years this year of, of running and working in, in the heart of Chicago. Maybe talk to me about some of those challenges and perhaps as, as a young person getting into this, you clearly had a, a fork in the road of going, you know, you've seen the political, maybe economical side of a city commercial we've also seen the, the beautiful side of the Chicago cares what sort of drove you down that path and then what are some of the challenges you face with that oh such a great question you know the road less traveled right the one mm, you, you think time. I, I when I always say um talk about my career I'm like it was never a straight path it was always mm. twists and turns and the thing that I like least expected or where the opportunity that just kind of came along and so much of that was I just I want to say a testament to the relationships that I've been able to have and build yeah. over the years but that's also through experiences and if I kind of had to narrow it down like I, I say I'm a lifelong volunteer because I volunteer for lots of things I'm the helper right like I'm the one who's like let me help like I can I can organize that I can help fix that or do you need a hand carrying that like I'm just kind of naturally that person. So I think because I've constantly volunteered myself for things and experiences, I've been able to put myself in the rooms where decisions are being made. And I've been able to be around the people and like have just, I think, masterfully built my network around that. So that's given the exposure and right. Chicago cares, you know, 30 years ago, first of all, there was no internet, right? Totally. So, yep. Right. Trying to organize people and find opportunities. There was a real need. So really important kind of facet of how Chicago cares was created by two incredible women, Mary Per Hall and Leslie Bloom, who just saw a need and, you know, really started to build what is now Chicago cares. And our mission is really to connect people of difference, right. And get them understanding each other and building empathy and understanding, and then moving folks to action to create a more equitable equitable city and hopefully a more equitable world, right? Um, Want people to look at things differently and through a different lens when they serve. We don't want it to just be about charity. We want it to be about justice. We don't want it to be about doing something to, we want to doing something with someone. We don't want it to feel like saviorism or missionary, which sometimes volunteerism can fall Mm, into that. We really want to talk about mutuality, right? Because if two people are together doing something, two people should get something out of that mutually. It shouldn't just be a benefit on one side or the other. So it's kind of changing some of the paradigm a little bit of how we talk about volunteerism and service. And that's been a big part of the journey of Chicago Cares and the evolution over the last 30 years. Yeah, we could talk for hours um, today about the, the structure of how the organization works. If you don't mind getting a little granular about how does the process work? Is it organizations will post opportunities, volunteers, is it almost like a marketplace in that sense, or you guys controlling that stream? Really, the, the purpose of that question is going through our time, and I'm sure through yours, there's, there's chance of not exposure, but uh, people just saying, we need 100 volunteers, get down here and, and get, get your job done and get out. And, yeah. and 
that sort of a churn and burn approach that never works to build a long-term organization right. based on volunteering. How do you manage that at Chicago Cares? Oh, you're a hundred percent right, Shannon. Like it's a little bit of everything, right? Yeah. Um, so we have really structured ourselves first and foremost to say, we're, we're volunteering for social good, meaning, you know, causes and organizations. So we, in a little bit of a way, are an intermediary, right? So we are working with other nonprofit organizations. We partner with a few hundred here in Chicago where we know they're doing incredible work on the ground, but they need help in the form of elbow grease, right? Getting, getting people to help out, but also like building those relationships, getting advocates, getting people involved in their cause. So what we do is in, in a way we play a matchmaker there, but we're really curating that experience. So it is, it's much less while our website certainly can be used in chicagocares.org, if anybody wants to check it out, right? Like our website can for sure be used to find a volunteer opportunity. You know, you kind of plug in what you're interested in in a zip code or a, a neighborhood, et cetera, and things will pop up that are opportunities, both ones that Chicago Cares creates and curates on our own, as well as partners like a Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or or, you know, YMCA, like they yep. have an opportunity and we'll post that. And we kind of call that a referral because Chicago cares is kind of the, the go-to website um, for Chicago. So we want to lift up other opportunities for folks, but when we curate something, we want to make sure that has kind of the stamp of Chicago cares yes. behind yeah, it. That's right. Important. And that's the, that's the piece that's different. And our quality standards are again, something as we talk about that paradigm shift of how we think about volunteering that's what we're looking at differently. First of all, those volunteer experiences have to be community led, meaning if we're going to be going to a neighborhood and working in a particular community, they have to tell us what they want. We're not going into that community and saying, Hey, I, and this is how it used to be. Yeah. Like it used to yeah, be, sure. Hey, we've got a hundred people. They want to yeah. volunteer next Saturday. What do you got? And mostly yeah. people like the nonprofits would make up busy work for people. Yes. And then folks would pat themselves on the back and be like, I did good. And I helped people that were needy, right? <laughs> like that was kind of the mentality. Yeah. And to what end though, right? Like, and when we talk yeah. about Im impact, when we talk about transformation, when we talk about how we want volunteers to feel, you got to do the hard work and it can't be, it can't just be a check the box, you know, it, and some of that is the introspective work that folks need to do before ever walking into a neighborhood or community. And I'll say for here in Chicago, right, we have predominantly the neighborhoods on the South and West side tend to be black and Hispanic, Yep. tend to be more impoverished, right? Not definitely communities that are less resourced and have been historically less resourced due to a lot of kind of policy and racism and injustice that we've seen for decades, right? But then sure. the volunteers have a tendency to be corporate or white or people with privilege, yep. right? So yep. you've just got this, this void of like, okay, people of difference back again to kind of the mission, right? We want to connect people of difference, but how do we do that in a way where they're coming at it, having a mutual experience and having, and feeling more like equals versus the haves and the have nots. Mm. And that's always the real challenge. And some of that is we used to say, we're putting the spinach in with the brownies. Like we're doing that. People don't know <laughs> that they need the education. They don't know mm. that they need to have some cultural competency before ever walking into a neighborhood to volunteer, to even clean up streets or plant a tree or, you know, play hopscotch with a kid. Like you kind of got to understand some basics about a neighborhood and a community and a people, a culture before ever walking in. Cause you don't want to come into that and be like, well, I know everything and this is how we should do it. You want to have some of that cultural humility. And that's an important part of what Chicago Cares brings to our programming. So that's really what we put into kind of our gold standard of what we curate. We certainly, with the other organizations we work with who we do referrals, we work with them on this. This is kind of one of our big lofty ambitious goals is can we teach the Chicago Cares way to everybody? Like, mm. you know, as we talk about, at, le at least in the nonprofit sector, you know, if we were to go away in 15 years because we did the work, like we completed our mission, we did our work, yeah. what does that look like? Yeah. And it does mean showing others how this concept of mutuality, how this concept of transformation can really happen. But there's a lot of elements to it and it takes more For time sure. and effort and intentionality. And I think that's the cool part about our work is we're being really intentional about it. Whereas for 30 years it was happening, but it was like the organic magic that we knew Chicago cares did, but we never like wrapped it up into a bow. Now we mm. have it like the formula, if you will, instead of yeah. the organic nature of it. And we're being intentional about making sure those elements are in place to ensure that, you know, real impact. I think um, it's such an interesting point. You've gone from sort of the, the top level volunteering, 
getting 100 people down, high yep. five some people, walk away saying, yeah, cool, I've done a great job. Um, T-shirts, I mean, photo op, yep. Yeah, that, that's, that's how potentially a lot of volunteering is seen around the world. The retention of that for volunteers to come back and do it again without that granular detail that you're talking about is a real struggle and, and people are used to that. I think that's the challenge in volunteering around the world is going, yes. oh, we don't expect them to come back because they're volunteers. Right. It sounds like for you, you spend so much time investing in those individuals. So if I was a volunteer, I would be trained and engaged yep. in so much more. It's almost you're training, engaging them on more about the, the organization and the city compared to the job that they are doing. Correct. Is there Correct. a difference like, there? Like, no, it sounds totally. like there is. And thank you. You totally nailed it because we have said it's not about the task. Yes. Right. The task yeah. is, again, cleaning up brash, planting a tree, painting a wall. The task is not that difficult. Not that it's not hard, but like it's honestly not that difficult. The hard stuff is, again, looking at our own biases, understanding ourselves, again, crossing, like willing to cross the bridge of difference and have some hard conversations and also find those commonalities in humanity that we all know are there. But when we start to see that, it go, you start to go, oh, okay, wait a minute. I, I see this now. But you have to be willing to put in the time to it. And what we have found is when we call it in, in our kind of lingo, it's like that's what makes a project sticky, meaning somebody's yep. going to come back, yep, yep, yep. right? Like it's interesting enough. And, and sometimes for us, and I think we can all acknowledge this as people, when something is a little bit challenging and a little bit hard, sometimes it's like, hmm, I got to sit with this. Mm. This is going to be a little bit mm. difficult, but it it holds my interest, right? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick around and see how this feels because it's intriguing to me. Whereas again, the check the box, easy to do, boom, boom, I'm done. Sense, yeah. You're, you're just not, you're not as attached to that. But if you knew, like you painted a fence and you met a bunch of community members that you'd never met before, you learned about a culture, you had some incredible food that was cooked locally. You talked to some people, you learned about some needs that they have that, Hey, you know what your cousin Vinny does whatever, right? Like, and you can make these connections and you're like, wow, I can now impact other people's lives in a way I never thought. Yeah. And I painted a fence today. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Yeah. And the, the byproduct is the fence that got painted right. Uh, right, in a right, way. Right. But it's um, very interesting because uh, our good friend, Mike Nishi, who, who put us in touch in Chicago, looks after the Chicago Marathon. He's on a podcast, a recent podcast for, for people to check out. What I really loved about Mike's approach to volunteering was that Chicago Marathon happens once a year and a volunteer will volunteer for that one Sunday or that weekend. So he was talking about how do his volunteers become better people for the community for 365 yes. days in the year. Yep. And for yep. Chicago Cares, there's only so much that you guys can physically possibly do. I think you've kind of summarized it, but it's like almost your input on the city or your impact is, is the, the actions that have been taken, but it's almost yep. about bettering the community by giving these people that are volunteering with you the life skills and the, the learning that they become yep. better people in the community outside of Chicago Cares. Can you talk That's to right. that a little bit? Yeah. It, so we talk about it in leadership, right? It's like leadership training and how to be a leader in your own community, how to be a leader in the volunteer experience that you're having at this moment. And so many of those tools are transferable to so many different things. It's in your job. It's in your personal relationships, right? It's about, it's about respect. It's about understanding others. It's about listening to understand like all things we as adults, I don't care where you come from or kind of what culture need to really understand and be a part of, and it makes you better. And then when we give you those tools, we want to kind of go forth in the world and spread, spread the love if you will, right? Like we want, to, we want that message and this kind of, we want to evangelize good volunteering and make sure that it is spread. And something that we're doing that I think is sometimes hard to pinpoint for us is this, what you're kind of talking about is also the influence that we have. So I think Chicago Cares is incredibly influential yeah. across the city. Again, to Mike and the marathon, like we're having conversations about how indeed he can influence those volunteers to do things year round and not just with us. Like how do we inspire them to lead with whatever organization they might be involved in, whatever kind of cause drives them, whatever mission that that they find super appealing. Like how can we get them more and more involved and engaged? And some of that is just teaching some of these basics, but it's also like unwinding from the task. And I think this is where traditional volunteering, volunteer managers, and you know, I know you guys at Rosterfy do a ton of sports stuff like the marathon where you think like, okay, but it's just, this is a, a momentary and a task thing, but like 
there's always a way to make that bigger. There's yeah. always a way, I think, to take that skill set. And the challenge I would say to folks that are in this field is think about how what the volunteers are doing can transfer to all different kinds of situations in their world, in their careers, and start to pull out those nuggets and think about how that transfers. And you can start to really build an incredible program that's not just getting tasks done. You still get your tasks done, but you're transforming hearts and minds. And that's what mm. we like to say, like, is our ultimate goal is we're, we're influencing people to think differently. And whether it's an individual, it's organizations, we're certainly thinking about systems and systems change in government, because if we're not influencing policy as well, especially when we talk about some of the social ills that we're trying to really combat within the city, we're not doing enough. So we want, we want to move people towards those goals. And while we're not an advocacy organization ourselves, and we're not kind of organizers, we are still organizing the field, if you will, to start to be advocates for themselves and how to kind yeah. of give them those tools. Yeah, fantastic. Um, it's certainly a very valuable asset for Chicago as a city to have you guys there yeah, and so you. embedded in, in, in the city culture. Can you talk to me about the size of the projects you're involved with? I understand over 200 different organizations, and nonprofits you're supporting. How many volunteers? What's the staff you're sort of managing that oversee yep. this? Talk to me in numbers, please. Let me give you my numbers pre-COVID because yeah, sure. pre-COVID was more kind of true to who we are. So managing 20,000 volunteers on an annual basis pre-COVID had a staff of about 40 people, almost a $5 million budget. And, you know, our folks were really well trained in kind of the event management side. But again, what we realized, and this is kind of the theme you'll continue to hear from me is there's an art and science to volunteering. Yeah. And Chicago Cares has the science and has had the science down. And we got the science with scale and as we grew. But at some points during our kind of history, we lost a little bit of the art. And the art is this finesse of the mutuality and those, those pieces that make it sticky. And it's that like getting back to humanity. So you really have to have both to have a really quality experience. And that's the thing that I think with our staff and our team that we really tried to bring. So it wasn't just, you know, for a very long time, we hired event manager type people and we were like, they're amazing and they're project managers and Excel spreadsheets and they have got it figured out. But then we realized, no, we need people that can talk to community and who can talk yes. to volunteers and do a spreadsheet, right? Which is a lot to ask in any one person, but at the same time, those were the skill sets. And we also realized the skill sets that folks might not have, because of course we're a nonprofit. So we have a lot of young folks kind of right out of college for second yeah. jobs. It's the things that we need to teach, right? So how are we internally really building up this work within ourselves? And when I talked about the leadership piece, right, Shannon, we also did that internally with our staff. Yeah, so cool. critical and important that our staff learn that. NPOs, nonprofits, we typically aren't great at management, meaning yeah. we promote somebody because they've been here a long time and they did a good right. job at their job, but they don't know how the hell to manage people, Yeah, <laughs> right? How <laughs> do we teach you. them to do that? And then they're yes. managing people and managing volunteers. Like, are we giving them the proper skill sets? So when we kind of realized that we needed to do some of that internal work to then execute it externally. I mean, everything really started to fall into place because you really do have to have, I always say like, get your house in order before you invite company, right? Like you got to get all of those kind of pieces and parts ready to go in order to invite other people in. So yeah. we did a lot of that work and it's, it's really done us well, as far as our reputation in the community, a lot of folks for years didn't, they were like, oh, you guys just paint schools. That was it. Mm. We just painted mm, schools. Mm, mm. And the crazy thing about scale, we had this big event, which was our signature event. And it was wonderful for a lot of reasons called Servathon. 5,000 people in a day, right? Wow. Huge. And actually we worked with Mike and um, his company on this because we lost a staff person who had all the knowledge. And then we were like, oh my God, we need somebody to help with this. So CEM came in to help us like event manage since they had so much experience with the marathon yeah. to manage this huge event. So we're going to 30 schools all across the city. There's a hundred plus buses, you know, we're doing a party in the plaza and a band and a stage. And I mean, it's a huge event, Massive. but we realized after 25 years that it wasn't getting to our goals. It had all mm. the science, none of the art. It had lost some of the connection point. Like that's all people knew for us back to the same kind of with some of the sports stuff, right? They come for that day. And sometimes we had people, that's all they came for. But every year they came to Servathon, but then they didn't volunteer with us later on and they weren't involved in other ways. So we realized we weren't making it sticky. And for us, what we realized was we had to pull back the scale 
to work on this piece. And then if someday maybe we could get back up to scale and what could that look like? I think it would still be reimagined very differently because also 5,000 people in a day sometimes is too much. It's a mm-hmm. lot on our partners. It's a lot on the community. It's just a lot of traffic in the city, right? <laughs> is, mm-hmm. is it the best thing? And are we getting to our goals? Or are we doing an event for an event's sake, right? Yeah. And I think those wow. were the questions we really asked ourselves as an organization. And I will say, this is like my ballsiest move as a leader. So here yeah. I am the CEO of an organization, this is our biggest fundraiser, raises, you know, well over a half million dollars for us. You know, it's what we're known for. Most people only knew us to do this. And I mean, that's what we got our press. I mean, we had a huge partnership with our school district, all the things. And then I kind of was like, what if we retired it? Should we do this anymore? <laughs> like, and started asking that question. Yeah. And I thought I was going to get fired, but I ended up convincing everybody, not just me, obviously the board and the other staff. And we did our data and had stats and we talked to people and we did focus groups and we really looked at it and made that hard decision and said, you know what? It's had its run. And sometimes you have to, I think, pull back and kind of shrink in order to grow. And this was one of those moments where we said, like, as an organization for us to get to truly who we want to be and, and the, the work that we want to be doing, we just need to condense ourselves a little bit and put the effort into these kind of experiences that we've curated that now have all these elements that at a scale like that would be timely and expensive. And until we kind of figure that piece out, let's just do it really well. Wow. Um, and that was, I give the board a lot of credit for going with that crazy call an idea. Cause it was, it was a shot in the dark to say, oh my God, can we not do the biggest thing that we've done for 25 years? And we still, we managed to take all that money transferred over. So the donors, the sponsors, everybody believed in us because we had backed the relationships. We had amazing relationships and people stayed with us and wow. have like figured out how to do other things with Chicago cares. And we're on board. We lost very little dollars and support from that. So it was, wow. it was a really great experiment. What an incredible story. Um, well done. Firstly, it's, Thank you. Uh, scary. Everything. Yeah, no, no <laughs> doubt. Um, and you know what? It aligns to my next question. It'd be a, a, a personal one, if you will. Um, that Janae, 15 years ago, working with the mayor's office, you know, running errands, you wouldn't have been able to make that call. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe, but it, like, what, what is, what has it been across the journey to for you as an individual, as a person, to feel comfortable in 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 backing yourself and confident to do these sort of things? Because a lot of people, and I think you and I have had this discussion, women in particular as well, to be able to say, put their hand up and risk these sort of things yeah. in an organization can be challenging. Maybe to other people that are going through this journey themselves, like what is it that's given you that confidence to to back yourself like that? Uh, you know. I want to say it's always been there, right? Like that's how my parents raised me. And it's been a piece and core of who I am, which Mm -hmm. is the truth. But then you add on that the layers of me being curious and inquisitive. And I watched for a long time, right back to the tables and seats of power that I was at. I watched all that go down and you can be in the room or you can be in the room. And I was always really in the room, like watching and watching the strategy happen and listening and analyzing and thinking about it. And so much that you start to, you start to mirror that you start to experience it. And, you know, I've, I've said a lot of times, again, as I coach people around career stuff, I'm like, you know, for me, I learned a lot from bad bosses. I've yeah, had a lot of not so great that. bosses. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you often learn, learn the I've most learned, from those, those situations. That's right. Hey. Like yeah. what not to do, yeah. um, all those. And, and I always said to myself, when it is my turn to lead, I'm not going to hesitate and I'm going to make the right decisions and I'm going to yeah. do what's right by my people. And I'm going to sometimes have to say the hard things and do the hard things. But like in the end, that's what's important. So I, I think it was just watching and listening and taking in all these incredible experiences that I had. And again, my work career and the exposure that I had at such a young age. I mean, I was an executive director before I was 30. I mean, I am very, very lucky to have had those experiences, but don't doubt that it wasn't without a ton of hard work and sacrifice on my end. And I think all of that and all those experiences have just laddered up to a moment like this to say like, I'm right. 
Like, mm. this is right. This is right. And, it, and, and again, I was validated by so many others who were like, oh my God, I never thought you'd ever ask this. Could it actually happen? Like, yeah. this is the thing that hinders us as an organization. We want to do da, 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 but because we spend half of our year and half of our resources on this one event, so true. we can't do any of that other stuff. Yeah. So it was either like double, triple our salary and our, and on our staffing or make this decision. So yeah. I, I think so much of that is again, what leads up to it. So again, I had to have some of that experience to be in this place, to make that decision. But I think you also have to surround yourself with, I always say as a leader, surround yourself with people smarter than you, right? Mm -hmm. Like I am by no means the smartest person on my team, not even close. I like to say I'm the one that gets to look pretty mm -hmm. and I'm just here, I'm just here to say the things, right? But like <laughs> my team is incredibly, incredibly smart yeah. and I, I listen to them and I ask the hard questions, but then when it is time for me as the leader to step up and take a hard line on things, I always do. I'm the one, I, my mother has constantly said, this is why you get paid the big bucks. And I was like, sure, nonprofit, big bucks. Yes, mom. <laughs> but right why well, I, I am the one who has to make some of those hard calls and stand in that. And it, it's not without its reservations or hesitations, but when you do, and then it's a win, it also gives you that experience for the next time. So, right. Yeah. So I think it's a series of all that builds in your career. For sure. And and it sounds like this was a call that was a positive one. I'm sure across your time, there's been calls you've had to make that have gone the other way. Where Maybe I failed uh, miserably, uh, Shannon. Yeah. Failed miserably. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It, it happens to all of us. Maybe for if there's a learning out of that, it feels like your connection to the why for the organization it, every decision comes back to that compared to yes. being almost irrational of, of just making calls because then and now it didn't make sense. That's right. From a CEO perspective, it, would that be a fair way to summarize it? it? It must come back to the why for the organization. Always. It's the yeah. greater good. No, it's not about me. If it's time for me to leave, then I need to make that the decision that I need to leave because that's my, like you cannot protect your own personal interests or anybody else's for that matter. When you're trying to drive forward an organization, you got to mm -hmm. come back to that core. What is the mission? Why are we here? And what is for the good of the organization? And even when that's the hard thing to say, right? So saying to people who had volunteered with us every single servathon for 25 years, I was the one that personally made those calls to say, Hey, making up names, Larry, Sandy, like sure. we're not doing it anymore. And here's why. Um, so you were on the phone yourself as a CEO. Oh, 100%. Uh, yeah, 100%. Sure. I think that's, For that's a learning long time itself. people. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they also want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Like why, like, why didn't we make this decision or da da da? And you know, you try to message it, you try to do all the things, but we knew there were certain people that like, they needed a phone call from me. Big time. So I, I did the dial in and did the phone calls and they were the hard conversations. It wasn't always easy. But you try to get people to understand the perspective and the direction of the organization and the evolution, right? Like I keep saying this has been an evolution. Yeah. We started this way. And again, this is a lesson in organizational growth. Sometimes scale can be to the detriment of an organization. Yeah. Because again, you get, you want size and like everybody wants to grow and it's like, you love it and it's good and do more, do more, do more. And you take out again, the art of it and some of the nuances of it. And then it gets, I mean, you're growing, yeah. you're growing and adding. And we, you know, used to be slots, 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 like more people, more people, big numbers. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, then it yeah. was like, and what are they doing? Are they having a good time? Are they coming back? And yeah. we weren't asking those questions as much. So I think yeah. that was a big lesson there. Yeah, awesome. Um, oh, this has been so, so valuable. I've, I've really enjoyed this, Janae. Um, for, for other cities, clearly Chicago Cares is a unique organization in a way. I don't know if there's any advice you have for cities this is a broad question around the way that they can engage their volunteers better in a city. I mean, really, maybe the, the pointed question is, there's lots of cities that we see around the world that have 20 different departments of volunteers, from environmental groups to, to sporting, to events that come into town, to um, not-for-profits. You've managed to try and centralize those a lot with your organization. Is there any advice you have for cities that are out there that have so many different departments doing different things, no economies of scale, any advice for those types of cities? The thing that people, I think, frankly, in this business make a mistake about is the volunteer is like the nice to have versus being a, an essential, right? Like volunteers can be so essential to so many businesses, but then they also treat it like, well, they showed up and it's okay. And I mean, it's kind of this la la land yeah. mentality we sometimes. Yeah, 50% turn up. It's okay. They're volunteers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no big deal. Whereas it's <laughs> no like, deal. treat it like a business, treat it like a job, right? Treat it like it matters and, and you'll get more from the volunteers in that way. So when you say it, like treat it like a business, treat it like a job, 
with all the nuances of, again, an NPO or right uh, NGO kind of organization and the kind of social mindedness that involved too. But there's economies of scale when you think about business. So again, you talk to any kind of city in the world, like, okay, you've got 20 different departments, you're all doing it differently. How can you centralize some of these functions? Do you all use the same background check? (laughs) Like, let's do some of the basic stuff. Like, can one person volunteer from the Department of Environment over to the, you know, aging department? Like, can you go back and forth? How are you using, how are you orienting people? Is there an orientation? How are you stewarding your volunteers? When we talk about volunteers, we also talk about it as we do with fundraising, which is stewardship. You have to constantly keep in contact with folks and give them opportunities. Otherwise, you know, again, you can't just talk to one person and then think they're ever going to come back just because, oh yeah, I had a great time that once, like you've got to ask them back again and again and say, thank you again and again. So how can you just get some of those processes back to business kind of mindset processes down without scaling too much that you lose the art, right? So back to that, there's this real fine balance of that. But I think finding the efficiencies in that is something that I would say to the cities. Because when I was chief service officer, so that was one of my roles at city of Chicago, working for the mayor, interestingly, under both Mayor Daley and Rahm Emanuel. So fascinating time in political history here in Chicago, as an aside, that is over (laughs) drinks conversation. Um, But it was, you know, that kind of a role was really incredible. And some that was part of my job was to really look at all these city departments and try to, you know, put some efficiencies in place. And I'll say from having been a government worker for a long time, it's really difficult because everybody's got their own thing and their own system and governments tend to be very antiquated when it comes to technology. And that's where I think technology can really help, right? Because there's, Mm. again, Rosterfy and other models out there of just like, it. you can do better than a spreadsheet. Like Mm. there's just, you can do better than Excel. (laughs) There are ways to manage things that I think make a lot of sense for folks that if they just make a little bit of an investment in training and technology that in the long run, they're going to get way more bang for their buck as far as involvement and people coming back, making those experiences sticky. And then that's just like the process and the organization side. Then don't forget injecting the art, the Mm. why, why it's so important, why it's so critical, who's the community that you're serving, why you're doing this work. Thank you. Come again. Thank you. Come again. Right. Get that cycle down. Big time. I think that's, you you hit the nail on the head there about going those once off volunteer engagements is almost, if if I blatantly look at it, it's like that was the past of volunteering. That was the, that's what people did last decade. And I think this is what your approach is, is the new approach of, I mean, let's face it, organizations have less full-time resource now. COVID's slashed a lot of jobs yep. in terms of people managing programs. So there's less people there to recruit more volunteers. Volunteers as well, like why don't we, why, why pay for seven different systems when you could have one? That's so there's great. cost savings there. Then there's, from a volunteer perspective, needing to re-recruit them every time because you only have a limited amount of opportunities within that vertical, within the city or within yep. the organization why don't you expose them to other opportunities that they can volunteer so that you're saving money on trying to find more volunteers. But I think at the end of the day, providing a better experience to that volunteer that they've signed up for a reason, right? Like they want to help their community. Don't make them go onto Google and try and find the next spreadsheet they have to sign up for. Like that's why I love about Chicago cares is it's a central place. People can go in a city. So um, I really think what you guys have built is, is incredible. Um, We've been very lucky to hear from you about your story with the organization today and and your personal story too, I think is one that people can look up to from where they can go from, from a volunteer in an organization all the way to the CEO. It's, it's an incredible story. So uh, we're close to time here. I'm not sure if there's anything else for you that you wanted to speak about. I know you've got the podcast that you're running as well. If you want to give that a quick plug yeah, and a little talk plug. about your program, go for yeah, your life. So we also, you know, I, I love this kind of podcast. Nobody can see me, but I have a fancy podcast microphone. Absolutely. Uh, we do one called uh, How Chicago Cares, also available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, where we really try to dig into working with our community partners and uplifting their voices. So often folks that don't have um, the kind of platform or access that Chicago Cares does, 
how do we get to really talk about meaty issues? So sometimes the conversation can be kind of heavy, but I think sure. it's really enlightening to learn more about how other organizations are navigating these really uncertain times and how we start to think about certainly equity at the lens. I think you probably heard those undertones in, in our conversation today, yeah. but continuing to look at everything with the lens of equity going forward and really kind of being critical of our own existing systems and how can we start to make some of those changes for this next generation? Yeah, awesome. No worries. That's, that's fantastic. We'll make sure that we are, uh, our listeners do check that out. We'll put a link into into the blog. So that's um, that's awesome. So, you know, look, I really appreciate your time. It's an incredible story, both individually and a, as an organization. So uh, this is why we started the podcast. It's these types of conversations. I appreciate your time. No, thank you, Shannon. Appreciate it so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Good on you. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Engage Volunteer Podcast with Janae Myers. We hope you enjoyed it. If this is your first time listening, then welcome. Our podcast aims to highlight the ways in which organizations and individuals are engaging with their communities to connect them with events and causes they're passionate about, with new episodes released each Wednesday fortnight. The best way to support us is to click follow where you listen to your podcast and tell your friends about us. For your next episode, we are very lucky to be joined by Alana Laguna, Head of Volunteers at Oxfam Great Britain. In this episode of the podcast, we take a deep dive into the impacts of COVID-19, including the changing landscape of volunteers in the UK, with traditional volunteers having been replaced, at least temporarily, by corporates and a younger demographic as a result of furloughs and decreased job opportunities. Alana discusses the need to create roles that are more flexible and technologically driven to attract a broader demographic of volunteers. We hope to catch you then.